Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi, Sushant. Hi, Mahesh. How are you doing today? Hi, Varun. Good, good. So, hello. Yeah, hi, Sushant. Um, so, so we're here today to talk about uh, cultivating tomorrow. A um, uh, little bit about the digital evolution in agriculture. So uh, before we jump into it, I'd uh, like to just do a brief introduction um, of myself and uh, my speakers. So I, uh, so I have about uh, over a decade of experience in product development and in startups, um, worked uh, in the IoT space primarily, um, worked across industries uh, such as smart buildings, uh, pest control, and most recently uh, for the last let's say about six years uh, within the agriculture technology space. Um, Dr. Mahesh has a, um, a PhD in crop physiology um, from UAS Bangalore. Um, he has a professional expertise in various areas of agriculture, including plant physiology and agronomy practices, um, and has served in, in, key, uh, in several key roles in uh, both uh, academic and private institutions. And Sushant is an IoT enthusiast with about six years of experience uh, uh, within designing various components for IoT products, uh, has built uh, IoT products for various industries, but uh, over the last also about six years um, has uh, been focusing on the, ag the agriculture space. So, so welcome, guys. Um, hope you're ready for a, uh, an engaging discussion. Yep. Great. Yes. Yeah. So, basically, I want to start with uh, talking about some of the the challenges that farmers and agriculture industry as a whole currently faces. This, I mean, can be, can become a very broad discussion, but. Uh, just to set the context uh, for the audience uh, and for the people that aren't familiar with the agriculture sector as a whole, um, why don't we introduce some of the problems? So uh, I'd like to direct this to Mahesh first, who's going to be talking about it from a farmer perspective, what happens um, on the farm. So, so Mahesh, from uh, being an agronomist, working directly with farmers, um, what do you see uh, firsthand as some of the big problems that farmers face? Thank you, Arun, for your kind introduction, right? Um, yes, we are aware that Indian agriculture is very diverse and then very vast. So henceforth, you can keep on listing the many challenges faced by the farmers. Uh, but however, I look into a different perspective, like say I want to very specific problems uh, the farmers face by, um, I put it in a di two different uh, uh, categories. One is knowledge driven, another one is non knowledge driven. Now, knowledge driven problems such as uh, your crop varieties, which are the crop varieties are suitable for your uh, system uh, uh, in the field, uh, then how much to irrigate? That's the main uh, uh, drawback in, in Indian agriculture. As of now, Niti, Niti Ayog says, uh, 65 million hectares of uh, total sown area is still under traditional uh, irrigation system. Only 5% of the total sown area is under the micro irrigation, wherein you can precisely irrigate the crops. Uh, then uh, third point here is the package of practices, how best the practices can be done to produce the good quality uh, harvests and then the mitigation of pest and diseases. These are the, like say, the few uh, knowledge driven problems uh, which are faced by the problems. Non-knowledge driven problems such as uh, farm activities, farm management, labor management, and all like say instruments, facilities. Uh, other than this, like say the market driven production, so and so and so forth. Uh, these are the main uh, points I would like to say that uh, which are all uh, in general the farmers faced by the challenge uh, faced by the problem uh, farmers. Uh, 
Yeah. I think uh, Sushan can uh, give him some in insights on this uh, problem. So, so. Yeah, so to, to, before we jump to, to Sushant, I just wanted to summarize. So um, basically, you've, you've talked about the fact that um, the usage of water is uh, a, currently a very big problem. Um, we see that farmers are over-irrigating their crops quite a lot. And uh, because of, of climate change and uh, more erratic weather patterns, water conservation and um, a more efficient use of water is becoming um, more of a, uh, a priority for farmers these days. Um, and then on top of that, you talked about access to um, agronomy related services. So such as what crop to sow, which variety to sow, um, as well as the nutrient and the pest and disease management. So we'll come to uh, some of the potential solutions for that a little bit later. But I want to give Sushant the chance to talk about um, what sort of um, problems farmers face that are outside of the farm, so um, connected to the value chain as a whole. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mahesh and Varun, to give us a, a good introduction about the program we are looking at. And thanks, Varun, for the nice introduction for us. So, Sushant here. As said, like as Mahesh already pointed out, all the relevant uh, issues on farm, what we a farmer face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, apart from that, uh, off-farm issues, we, we can categorize under uh, many, many categories. So, I'll just summarize the point which we're looking at. So, very first thing is, having access to the credit. So you want to work, a farmer wants to work with a crop in which he wants to sow across. So he should have a capital or he should be able to access a, a credit from a, a local market or a government body to uh, to source that seed and relevant part parties like your pesticides, your fertilizer, other things. So that he can create a, a chain of uh, processes in which he will be using those inputs for his field and cultivation processes. Apart from that, once these things are ready for him to manage, he has to make sure this item is also linked with the market. So I, today I'm having a requirement of a, a fertilizer, which is a, a fertilizer A, and then tomorrow I have a requirement of pesticide B due to some local circumstances. Does my market allow me to have that in time, in, in time and have the availability to process this? So these are the issues we will be facing apart from the on-field issues and then once these two challenges are overcome we have a second a third issue coming up is supply chain architecture where once we have the crop ready to uh, harvest so is my supply chain ready to take it up store it process it and then move it forward for further uh, applications so we have seen like sometimes the quality of a crop is not up to the mark what you see in the market. And if if uh, a simple store keeps us food for two or three days, the quality reduces. So does so this uh, storage and the, the market uh, infrastructure allows us to have a good control. So this is very much a, a difficult. First of all, it's a difficult task, not a simple task. So supply chain infrastructure is very much important. Um, many many processes are already done in this case, like where these things are optimized as well as. Uh, as per market requirement, may these needs these are the issues we face for uh, perishable, non-perishable, and then long duration crops and all. And last will be the availability to the inputs, uh, the produce which we make. So, what are inputs are required while cultivating the crop? Apart from the agronomy support and all. So earlier, if you say like technologies way, way back old in, in 1980, 1990s, may used to have like. Uh, or India radio where they used to broadcast some messages and today technology upgraded and then we have some new scenarios like uh, WhatsApp groups or a channel or a simple KVK program where they gather a people of uh, far, a group of uh, farmers and distribute information. So how these informations are distributed? So the inputs here are not only related to the crop as required in, uh, in a pesticide or a fertilizer as well as the information at the right time and the right process in that area needs to be addressed. So how we will be challenging it? Uh, how, this becomes a challenging part to address. And the best, the bottom line of this is needs to be a cost effective. So the last point will be the cost which we have to look for it where uh, it needs to be in a pocket 
friendly scenario to address to all the audience across. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I think you've uh, you've covered uh, holistically um, the off farm ch challenges which uh, are affecting our farmers. Um, again, just for for a quick summary, there you started off by talking about access to credit, um, then on the market linkages and the supply chain, uh, and finally the access to the inputs. Now. Across the board, uh, we've seen a lot of startup activities specifically within this space where it's uh, looking at uh, eliminating the middlemen between the farmer and the consumer and uh, even um, e-commerce for, uh, for your farming inputs such as seeds and fertilizers, um, as well as uh, a lot of NBFCs that have now come up and focused within the agriculture sector, um, providing access to, to credit to farmers. Now, that's uh, uh, great. And, um, but I think between the three of us, you know, we, uh, we have uh, a lot of experience of what happens on farm, right? Uh, more than uh, what happens uh, off the farm in, in the value chain. So I want to direct our conversation um, uh, towards that. So when we talk about the on-farm challenges, Mahesh, to you, um, what are the 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 three uh, like? If you had to choose three of the biggest challenges to farmers, uh, what what would they be? Uh, yeah. Uh... The first first point would be the crop selection, crop information and selection, which variety should be selected and then which variety are of the crop uh, is suitable for the farm. Uh, the second point would be the soil health, how best the soil health is to produce my crop. Uh, the third point would be the agronomy of, uh, you know, practices, mitigation of pests and diseases. So just a little bit to uh, give uh, uh, a little bit information on these three points. Crop information and selection would be like, uh, say, suppose if you want to grow for uh, vegetables. So which vegetables is suitable for my farm, whether the farm is suitable to give the enough irrigation or not and all. And then the whether the soil, if you come to the soil, let's like say the soil is, uh, uh, is having enough nutrients, uh, whether it is having a good pH, EC, so that it can it can deliver the uh, nutrients available to the crop throughout the crop cycle. And then the third point would be like say the agronomy of like say how best to practices like the how plant density can be maintained. Uh, and then the pest and diseases like say suppose if you have a cloudy weather, which are the diseases or pests would be arrived. And then you can predict and then mitigate it as and when. So these are the best uh, three points I can choose. So uh, I had asked you for three. Uh, uh, and <laughs> there are many, the, right? Yeah, there are um, many more. I think I'd like to also just highlight uh, for the audience that um, labor availability uh, seems to be yeah. uh, uh, an extremely big challenge. Uh, even in my yes. personal family farm, we constantly have rotation of labor and trying to find people that are reliable who can stay um, and who can work the way that we need them to work um, yeah so yeah so I, I would like to throw in uh, the uh, just, just to add add into this your labor uh, you know availability and management wherein the even like IOT technology can be intervened there to reduce the labor dependency in farm activities. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There, um, there is a lot of uh, of automation yeah. and uh, and uh, digital technologies that are coming in to help address that problem, which actually transitions me to uh, the next point that I wanted to talk about, which are actually some of the solutions um, that exist today for farmers. So, uh, so just for the uh, the sake of keeping it. Uh, uh, diverse. I'll uh, ask the next question to 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 Sushant. 
So when it comes to market access, um, so giving farmers um, access to markets for them to sell their produce, uh, what do you see happening today across India um, with regard to solutions to make it easier for farmers? So this is a question like once you have the produce ready, what to do with the produce once it's ready? So usually common practice as on today is like they will connect with a local trader. Local trader can be your, one of your, uh, what we say, bulk buyers in an area where we can sell this product to or a government body like APMC where this APMC is also access. Now, this is a new thing coming up, APMC is where uh, technology can add on to these and give them a real-time price. What will be the price of purchase from the produce and ability to share this price across that area. So if there are like 50 farmers in an area where they want to sell this item at, so it cannot be like a first person is selling at a price X and second person sells at price Y. So once we have this option to set a price for a crop for that time and duration, so all the farmer in that area will benefit the same element. So having the ability to share the price for the day and should be deliverable to all the community farmers available in that area. And then we have contract farming coming up. So where uh, a, a private body or a government body working for a private body order scenario where they take up a common uh, prescribed practices to be followed on your crop and then track it over the time for the uh, production of the crop once it is produced. And then we do grading like once these practices are followed, we get the product out of the quality produced done and then this goes forward for this uh, but uh, post process of this food in which it uh, we add traceability to make the pr product valuable and then you might have heard of new uh, entities like ONDCs, ENAMs where they help us to give a platform to sell my produce anywhere on a larger platform so uh, like uh, uh, ruling out any middleman in the picture so that we have a common ground and a common price for all. So these are technological help we are getting as of today to address the issues of a farmer once we have many middlemen and other local bodies to rule over. Yeah, so basically what you're saying is for the farmers that um, currently do work within the traditional system of local traders and, and APMCs, Having um, access to real-time price information um, is important for them, which there are um, tools for already. Um, and the, the government of India does have a portal where farmers can access uh, the real-time pricing um, for Mondays all across India. Um, and then secondly, you talked about contract farming, which is basically... Um, eliminating the middleman, right? Where you have a uh, crop grown for a specific use or for a specific buyer, um, which is uh, is something that a lot of startups are working on, um, as well as a lot of um, uh, big uh, agri institutions. Um, but that may not always be available to farmers, right? Um, these uh, these contract farming opportunities um, are few and far in between when you look at the the, the large scale of, uh, of agriculture in India. So finally, you talked about digital markets like ONDC and ENAM. So again, in, in the case of uh, farmers not having access to a company that wants to buy from them directly, they can find direct buyers online through uh, portals like ONDC and ENA. So I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, work happening right now, both from the public and the private sector in, in, um, in addressing this market linkage problem. So going back to uh, one of the things that uh, Mahesh had brought up with regard to crop selection. So this is a big question that every farmer asks in the beginning of the season. What crop do I sow so that I'm most profitable at the end of the season? So, uh, so Mahesh, can you talk about how the farmer goes about making that decision currently, and uh, and and how it can be improved? Yes. 
uh, this is the need of the our question varun uh, why because uh, see more almost all the farmers think uh, to produce more and then get benefited out of it so first and foremost thing uh, farmer should do that so before selection of the crop he should uh, test for the nutrient analysis of his farm soil okay he should uh, uh, should have the information of uh, his soil nutrient status ph ec so and so etc what is the soil type so and so so that based on that he can select the crop okay selection of the crop again it depends on the weather condition uh, whether uh, the monsoon is on set or delayed or it will be very erratic and so and so there are many varieties suitable for the you know like uh, a late onset of monsoon or early onset of monsoon so based on that he can select the varieties there are short duration varieties long duration varieties okay the uh, based on that he can select based on uh, the crop nutrient uh, availability uh, the soil nutrient availability also um apart from that so uh, he can you know look for the accessibility of the market where he can select suddenly he cannot grow the dragon fruit to sell it in you know some place so he can also should look for the crop uh, you know market that also uh, if you give a, a little more insight in then how best uh, nutrient management can be done based on your soil nutrient status say suppose if you have a medium range of nitrogen or phosphorus potash is there in your soil you can you can go for a little higher application of nutrient application so that you can produce good uh, good harvest uh, apart from that i i already told you that uh, again uh, the pest and disease management uh, where it comes there uh where the you know iot technology can be intervened that to forecast and then uh, uh, how best we mitigate the uh, pest and diseases absolutely uh, these are the best uh, uh, points i feel to say. yeah so i mean um just a personal experience from my side uh, before i got into agriculture uh, technology i actually rented about a half acre um, of greenhouse space uh, close to bangalore cool. and started to grow um exotic vegetables and the uh the first uh, piece of advice that uh, was given to me was find your market first because especially when you're dealing with perishable goods i mean your harvest comes and you literally have a few days to harvest before they start um over ripening on on the plant and you're kind of scrambling for a market and then at the end you're either giving it away for free to your friends and family or or you're getting a very low low price for it so yes um definitely uh finding uh the right market for your crop uh i think is the first question uh that needs to be answered and then subsequently based on what uh, market access you have or what crops have good market access in your region then you go for the environmental suitability whether it's uh, suitable uh, for your specific soil and the climatic uh, conditions for that season um really i think uh, a nice uh, um analogy is that uh, you know sowing a crop in the beginning of the season is like buying a stock where uh in in the share market where there's so many factors that are out of your control that affect uh, how much profit or loss you're going to make um after a certain amount of time and uh really the idea is to minimize your risk i mean and if you go through the right steps of making sure you you choose a crop with let's say a stable price and one that is suitable for your field then your chance of being profitable at the end of the season is higher um but that being said there are a lot of things that are out of a farmer's control but there are things that are in the farmer's hands such as your nutrient management uh, your irrigation management and your crop care with regard to the pest and diseases that you may face so um so again uh, to you mahesh uh 
what sort of uh, you, you've talked about the fact that that IoT and let's say for uh, to extend that precision farming or smart farming um, can help lower the risk for farmers um, in their crop cultivation. So can you can you tell me a little bit about your experiences um, using precision farming systems to grow crops? Absolutely, Varun. Yep. Uh, uh, you have given a guru, uh, very uh, good analogy on, uh, uh, I don't know, like say selection of the crop, how uh, how the farmer can invest in his crops. <laughs> good, thank you, Varun. Uh, as our experience, in the sense of our own hands-on experience on uh, IoT automation, irrigation, fertigation, so we have a farm. Uh, and then wherein we have installed this automation irrigation system there. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is it's 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 uh, based on the sensor based irrigation so that you can irrigate the crops as and when required real time irrigation. That uh, uh, the advantage here is you uh, reduce the uh, labor in dependency. Second thing is you are not wasting the water. So we could observe that, like say, more than uh, 30 to 7, say 30 to 50 percent of the irrigation water we saved. Then, so the balancing with the irrigation water, you can uh, reduce the nutrient uh, application to the crops also. So wherein we 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 saw almost 50 more than 50 percent of the fertilizer application we reduced it. Why? Because we are irrigated only to the rhizosphere, wherein you say this uh, roots are grown in the soil. We call it as a rhizosphere where the roots are there. So we are irrigated only to the rhizosphere, and then we applied to the fertilizer, uh, applied to the crop with the nutrients as in required. Uh, because of uh, a very uh, precise irrigation. Uh, we could reduce the runoff, we could reduce the nutrient wastage. And then uh, because of your low irrigation, you could manage the uh, relate, relate, less relative humidity. So the microclimatic region of the plant is uh, uh, well aerated so that you can reduce the uh, weed uh, infestation or weed growth, pest attack, a pest in the sense both insects and disease attack was very low. Apart from that, you are maintaining the aeration in the soil. So the soil roots, uh, plant roots also required aeration that uh, roots also respire. It requires uh, air to respire to grow the roots. So you are maintaining the uh, aerobic condition, not anaerobic condition. If you are irrigating, over irrigating, it, you are creating the anaerobic condition wherein crop root growth hinders. So uh, these are the main points we observed by, you know, uh, adopting the IoT automation irrigation system in our form. Uh, this is a need of the hour. This is this information should be spread across the farming community where we should be educated to the farmers. Yeah, what I observed. yeah. Um, I, I think it's it's basically the the next step forward, like um, when it comes to uh, how farmers uh, deliver water to their crops, mm -hmm. going uh, pretty far back, um, P, uh, farmers used to, and actually still do for uh, uh, a lot of areas, flood their fields, right? So they actually um, turn on either a pump or they have access to uh, a water source like river close by and they literally flood their fields um, then the uh, the introduction of drip irrigation came which significantly reduced the amount of water that uh, farmers use because again they're not flooding their field they're delivering the water through these drip pipes exactly at the root zone of the crop so and now uh, let's say soil moisture sensor based uh, irrigation takes that even further and um, if I heard you correctly um, compared to just traditional drip irrigation and a standard package of practice um, yes. you've seen up to 50 percent savings in water um, uh, for a crop right yeah in our crop we have grown the tomato and then capsicum 
right now okay so we have observed 30 to 50 percent it's because based on the crops uh, uh, water requirement in tomato we have observed uh, around 39 percent reduction in uh, irrigation water than traditional irrigation okay. yeah, as i mentioned in earlier like say the uh, 65 per, 65 million hectares of total zone area of uh, in india is still under the traditional irrigation system that is uh, flood basin irrigation system yeah wow okay yeah um so you so you've talked about how uh, precise irrigation helps uh, helps with the the growth of the crop you did talk slightly about how that reduces the amount of fertilizer. Can you explain that a little bit more? It's not uh, yeah. obvious. Right. So uh, as we are aware that uh, new soil is also having certain of amount of nutrients, amount of nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. These are the main micro macro nutrients. Okay. So... When you, uh, we recommend in the sense, uh, any ICR institutes or uh, state agriculture institutes, based on the agroclimatic reason, they recommend the uh, uh, dose of fertilizer, like say, how much fertilizer should be uh, given to the crop. Like say, for example, if you take tomato, because we have done extensive research on tomatoes, that's why I'm taking the tomato as itself. So, uh, Indian Institute of uh, Horticulture Research. This is the one of the governing uh, entity of uh, ICR uh, under the ICR Institute. They recommend 100 cases of nitrogen, 100 cases of uh, phosphorus, 80 cases of potash is required for Karnataka uh, agroclimatic reason, wherein this has been developed based on the traditional irrigation system. So the as the common farmer, how he does the irrigation, based on that, they have developed this uh, dose of uh, fertilizer recommendation. Now, we call it as RDF, recommended dose of fertilizer. However, what we observed from our research in, uh, I know, using IoT-enabled uh, automation, irrigation plus uh, uh, fertigation unit there. So, uh, based on the soil moisture sensor-based irrigation, so as I told you, we are, uh, we are we have given only the rhizospheric irrigation uh, water we have given to the plant. So that what happens, what used to happen in the farmer field, we just think about that. Uh, imagine that, like say, if you are over irrigating and then more, uh, apart from that, in addition, you are giving uh, uh, nitrogen or any kind of fertilizer. So the over irrigation will take away your uh, nutrients from your rhizosphere of the plant. So thereby, you are wasting the nu nutrients from you know uh, over irrigation. Uh, in our studies, what we did, okay, we are uh, over uh, uh, irrigation is not required for the crop, so that we can reduce the fertilizer nutrients load also. Uh, so basically. Well, you're talking about a balance of water and fertilizer where Absolutely. if you are using sensors to reduce the amount of water um, going into your field, then you you need to reduce the amount of fertilizer going into the field. Do you have yes. any experiences uh, of trying to use the same recommended dose of fertilizer but using soil moisture sensors um, to do the irrigation? And what was the impact on, let's say, yield and quality? Huh. Um, yeah, we have uh, done extensive work in tomato, capsicum, and banana. Uh, I'm just giving an example of tomato. But if you uh, if you see in banana, we have reduced, uh, say, 50% of uh, fertilizer application for, uh, in banana. And then 50% uh, of the less irrigation as traditionally the farmers does. So uh, the bisha ratio has increased that, right? In both the, all the crops, what we have observed, the balancing of the both irrigation and the nutrient application works well. So thereby you can reduce the cost incurred for the fertilizer application as well as the, uh, the water, uh, you know, irrigation water. So nowadays 
we are facing lot of irrigation water we do many of the you know like say agriculture lands doesn't have the irrigation water so that we can use the you know uh, the saved water for the irrigation absolutely hmm? great uh, so i before moving to to sushant on the the sensors and the uh, actual technology behind it i just wanted to spend maybe another 2 minutes uh you had talked about pest and disease management being another challenge um and you you have talked about how um uh, precision farming systems or smart farming systems can help with irrigation and nutrient management but how can they help with pest and disease management ha uh, absolutely like say uh say agronomic practices as we say we have we say agronomically as an agronomist i say suggest uh, farmers to go like say you uh, uh, plant the uh, samplings in a distance so that there will be aeration should not be you know confined to microclimatic condition wherein you build up uh, relative humidity reduce the temperature so that it is congenial for the disease or pest to come and then attack your plant so and so forth that is apart from your agronomy as a uh, technology oriented like say you require uh, to predict your uh, uh, disease or pest to uh, when it uh, arrive in your uh, in your farm um, just to give an example best example here is the grape farmers where the farmers grow the grape so they understood now they are very well uh, you know uh, educated in uh, predicting the disease called powdery mildew and then downy mildew so they understood let's like, say continuous 3 hours of you know rains comes continuously and then there is a, a build up of uh, relative humidity in the your farm of above 95% and then uh, say uh, some window of uh, 20 to 25 degree celsius temperature is there whole day uh, definitely they will uh, go for the next day spray to you know prevent the powdery mildew attack in uh, the wine yard so thereby he can reduce the you know like say more than 90% of the uh, your pesticide ap- application in, in in the farm so suppose you think that after the infestation of the powdery mildew he can go and then spray means he has a chance of 50 50 to reduce the pest attack there so thereby uh the, you know weather based uh, pest and disease management is crucial so basically uh what you're saying is that uh the 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 iot systems don't actually look for the pests even though uh yes. but based on the weather conditions that are suitable for that pest or disease to to multiply within the field that yes. data is used um to proactively treat the pests and diseases and um actually from my experience i mean um during a tomato crop season a traditional recommendation would be to spray once every 3 days right um at the yeah. certain stage where that pest or disease uh, would affect the crop whereas using um weather information and uh, specifically microclimate weather information that is there within that farm um you don't need to spray every 3 days and uh, you just wait for the conditions to be uh suitable for that pest or disease to show up and proactively spray before the pest and disease start to spread right yeah okay Absolutely. great yeah and uh and you've seen that that's uh that that's worked and uh and has in your experience you have reduced the amount of sprays that uh, that you do right perfect perfect you are right yes right. uh so so mahesh thank you so much for that in depth uh, and uh, i i think very easy to understand uh, agronomy uh, lesson for all of us um so i want to uh, go to to sushant for a little bit uh, to talk about some of the sensors that are used in farming today and uh, and what are some of the the challenges with let's say implementing those sensors and 
uh, building a system that uh, that uh, basically collects all of the data and then finally gives actionable insights to a farmer. Okay. Yes. So as as mentioned, like Mahesh sir has already covered across extensive points of what are the challenges we face and what are the things will be happening in the field. So as I said, uh, to when we get to know there is a disease coming up, if we apply after it has occurred, so we have a chance of 50-50 to fix it up. Having a solution already, IoT solution already to identify your microclimatic weather of your field or any other parameter which is used to map how your crop will move forward, what will happen to your crop, will eventually help you to take an action in real time and solve it in the early stage where the, the, the availability of, or like we have a chance to kill this Western disease faster from 50 to 50 to 70 to 90% as well. And we have seen these examples in our field, experiment field as well, where the uh, microclimatic weather was used as one of the key factors and till it's been used across so that we are able to take actions and uh, we have prevented the growth of weeds in the field. So coming to the point of, so to the point of where, what plant needs to be needs for a technology point of view, what we need to check for a plant to grow. So we start from very basic form, we start from the soil. What soil will be contributing to a plant's growth? Soil will contribute water and other microbial activities and as, as well as as we have laid down our pipelines for drip irrigation or a sprinkler or a bubbler scenario. Many, many pipelines and are there. So these will be used to distribute the required fertilizers and once we and the, the temperature so there is a there is a range of operation of a plant in this temperature range it will work out or how much water needs to be given in a shrubs scenario in a medium growth scenario and when it starts to give flowers and then when it's the fruit is being up so each stage is now monitored in this case so we say like a, a, a crop of capsicum will take six to eight weeks to grow in first three weeks, it will take a little amount of water or like the, so the water requirement will be less because it's in the shrub, shrub size and we need not to irrigate the field as we do in a general basis. So to, to check this, we check for how much water content is in the soil. So we term it as soil moisture or uh, water level in the soil. Next is the how much water is being evaporated from the soil because soil being an open field there will be a chance of evaporation. This, this term is now having a direct relation with the temperature of the soil it is being fed to. As well as the air around it, what is the temperature and humidity is available in that area. So so these so two I just want to uh, stop you there. Uh, uh, you had mentioned uh, soil moisture sensors, right? Yes. And I think uh, today, especially, there are many, many types of soil moisture sensors in the market. Yes. Um, so can you give our audience a little bit of clarity on what the different types of sensors are and uh, what your recommendation would be? Okay. So this, uh, in the context of soil moisture sensor, this is one of the key sensors which we see like it, it, it helps us to manage across majority of the work we do in a field. When to irrigate, when to uh, put fertilizer, when to put pesticides and what to do with the further actions of the plants. So we have many types of soil moisture sensors. So basically, uh, majorly they are categorized under uh, resistive type capacity, uh, resistive type sensors, a capacitive type sensor, and a combination of uh, capacitance and resistance. So these are like uh, time diffraction sensor scenarios. So uh, the commonly used are on the uh, resistive based sensor where we have uh, two elements in which we check the conduction across and see what's the conduction is happening and then we arrive at the conclusion of uh, this is the amount of water is in the in this in the field the issue with this sensor is limited to if we have applied uh, fertilizers a fertigation uh, system in that area or we have distributed fertilizer in that area this reading will not be in accurate format up to 40 to 50 percent then we go for a, a volumetric analysis where we see what will be the mimicking or we mimic the uh, ratio of water which, which will be taken by a root of a plant versus actual sensor. 
in this case we uh, sample the output to an average value over a period of time of like 10 to 15 minutes and then we take a decision this is the right value of it here we'll be able to get the uh, results up to the range of uh, 2 to 5 percent but obviously this range comes with the cost which we have to see like uh, how does it fit in the criteria lastly will be the time domain uh, refractometry where we see how much time it takes from two elements to conduct uh, con to conduct the electricity from point a to point b so once we see in uh, uh, electronics format uh, operations like electrical design format man, the time duration it takes is equivalent to the amount of salinity a soil will provide me when water is poured into so these are the ways and these are giving me a range in the error range these are like 15 to 35 percent so the error factor is what is contributing to the the complexity of the sensor and the price factor. Now, if so you are uh, more accurate sensors are more expensive, which is yes, I mean, yes, pretty, yes. Yeah, a pretty well uh, understood concept. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, so, so so go on. So you've talked about uh, different types of soil moisture sensors. So when it comes to nutrient management, uh, what sort of sensors are let's say I wouldn't say available. I would say what sort of sensors are commercially viable for agriculture in India today? So we have many parameters to look for in a soil and the fertilizer we apply across. But as Mahesh has already covered across earlier, we are keen in knowing the soil nutrient that is your NPK and pH and EC of the EC content of a soil because these are the five factors which contributes the growth of the plant in a very fast manner. So any change in any change in these values will have a direct effect on your plant over the next one week. So we are talking in a short term change in these parameters. So we as as my said in the earlier, like once we start sowing a crop, we check for a soil nutrient level. What is the soil nutrient level is left with? And we apply accordingly the relevant fertilizer at start so that this is maintained throughout the project. But there are some locally, uh, what we say, forecasted issues like you have heavy rain, suddenly you have a heavy rain or suddenly you have a uh, drought. Even though you have a viable water source, these will result in change of nutrient uh, wash off, wash off. Or your nutrient will be so dried up, it will go below the, uh, the root zone itself. So to maintain this, we have sensors for uh, EC, that's your electric conductivity or commonly known as TDS. What is the salinity content of your soil? This helps us to maintain how much uh, NPK saturation is available in your soil. Next is your uh, pH, where the pH is an important factor for the soil to maintain the root life cycle. Any upper change or lower change by looking at a plus two change, plus and minus two change here will kill the root itself in which it, the plant will die. So maintaining pH is very much crucial in this case as well. And then we have nutrients. Uh, just to add in um, before you you jump ahead, um, basically the 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 fertilizers that are used are actually chemicals that we're putting into the soil, and uh, we're putting chemicals into a biological system, and we need to make sure that the quantity of these chemicals that we we put in doesn't hurt the crop. So in a broad context, pH and EC are two very cost-effective sensors, which are good indicators of an overall um, level of chemicals uh, in the soil. But um, uh, have you seen any, uh, any sensors that will give me, uh, for example, a real-time reading of how much available nitrogen is there, phosphorus or potassium, your, your NPK? Um, because I've been looking for those for a while and <laughs> haven't come across them. Okay, so and that's a good question. So there are approaches, like there are two approaches. Either first one is the detective approach. As I said, like the salinity of the soil will have a direct relation with the concentration of NPK. And second is the actual test is the refractometry test across where we take a soil sample and then we run it through a spectrometer by making it a solution. And lastly, uh, these are accurate up to 5 to 10%. Uh, 
uh, lastly a lab, lab test where the whole setup goes as a lab so like as my said in this like in the start of the crop may we use a lab setup to get to know what is the npk level so these are the three processes in which the currently the npk is used for a commercial purpose on a large basis so once we have more insights we like derivative solutions are less accurate but we'll have a insight to look for to start with that makes sense um so going into the environmental sensors yeah w- what are the main sensors that uh, are important for agriculture okay so again coming back to the field if you have open field and and if you have a green house so each of them is having its own requirement so the common throughout will be the relative humidity in an area so i'll just list out the parameters which we are looking at and then i'll bring in the sensors which will will be atta- attaching to it so parameter we start from soil we will start from air so air may we have wind speed wind direction and rainfall uh, wind speed will tell you uh, what will happen to your crop if it is too windy or uh, what will happen to the fruit of the crop if it is too windy wind direction will tell which direction it is flowing across so that you can manage your uh, the f- fruits uh, falling from a tree and accordingly take an action across rainfall is one of the key factor where uh, if you are having autom- automation system like we do experiment with automation system to save water we actually use this as a uh, irrigation uh, input for us so if we have scheduled irrigation tomorrow and we forecast there will be rain tomorrow we can just skip the irrigation and save water for ourselves for other purposes so that's a rainfall sensor here next parameter will be your radiation sensor also known as uh, solar radiation sensor or luxometer where we see how much solar uh, the sunlight is available for a plant to do photosynthesis as well as it contributes to water evaporation apart from what we have irrigated then we have air temperature air humidity and air pressure sudden change in air pressure meaning there will be a chance of a uh, high humidity scenario and sudden change in uh, uh, humidity also represents uh, uh, a, ch- a chance of having a disease being forecast forecast so today there is a change the propagation of pest disease will happen after day or two but we have a notice to us saying that this has happened there is a chance let's take an action so that we are 100% sure that this does not come to us and then to be with the uh, plant we have the leaf fitness sensor where we check how much water is being absorbed by the leaf in the scenarios so these are the uh, sensors i summarize across we have plenty more these are the commercially used or like widely used sensor to predict a pest disease model as well as the the crop availability and the crop uh, the flower uh, rate of sustainability with the wind scenarios yeah um so mahesh from an agronomy perspective uh can you talk about how w- weather information can help uh with um understanding the crop growth uh, in the context of degree days and also um how uh evapotranspiration can be used to schedule irrigation yeah bro sure uh before adding to the points there uh, sushant has given a, a very uh, a good information on uh, all weather parameters uh, for instance if you take the weather uh, wind direction wind uh, velocity and all this information is needed for a, a farmer to when to go for the spray how much to spray and all because if you have we recommend it if it is a more than 2 km per hour uh, wind speed is there then we we sh- will not recommend him for spray any chemicals or pesticides and all uh, likewise so as you asked uh, to look into the evapotranspiration and then the the irrigation can be done based on that uh, if if uh, the you know the to calculate the evapotranspiration we require uh, uh, wind velocity wind direction temperature and then relative humidity these are required to calculate the uh, vapor pressure deficit in the air and the vapor pressure deficit in the leaf so that the difference between the leaf and the air can be uh, easily calculated and then you can uh, say that okay this much of uh, uh, water has transferred uh, from the plant or like say 
transpiration and evaporation say evaporation is the uh, the water is uh, going out from the soil to the uh, environment is the evaporation in a simpler way and then the water is going out from the plant to the environment is the transpiration so that we can calculate based on the weather parameters such as he has mentioned already the uh, we you know relative humidity temperature so and so and then uh, uh, coming to the uh, like say uh, prediction of your uh, pest and diseases can be done with this weather parameters uh, uh, if it is a high humidity low temperature and then so and so you can uh, there are many models in each crop to predict the pest and diseases then the yeah. phenology of the crop i'll actually right? just stop you there um, because we're running out of time and i kind of want to cover two more important topics so i um, i think it's pretty clear from the discussion that we've had and um in both of your experiences that precision farming actually uh, has a lot of benefits for farmers and uh, smart farming technologies and and an iot enabled sensors and uh, combined with an automation system does have a lot of benefits so the biggest questions are why aren't farmers adopting it at a large scale um sushant why don't you 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 take this one give this a shot yeah so uh, very first thing i'll say like the as, I, as we have already discussed earlier like the the ratio of the accurate sensor costs more so cost is the very first criteria we are looking at so so for a farmer uh the number says like almost 45% of the community falls under the below poverty line in india to even access this technologies so we have to give a solution but we should not give a solution which is like far more accurate than required or like it's less accurate than the required scenario you just can't give a wrong solution so cost is a very big factor which is uh, which a farmer not able to do and eventually even if he wants to apply for the device uh, to apply for the device or the solution across the financing agencies are reluctant to give as there is a chance of uh, risk of will i will the financing agency getting this back money back from the farmer he eventually our device which we give across will work but what the farmer does with the uh, finance which has received is the question mark there, there these are the two major one of the two challenges and then the education of the knowledge of precision farming and the automation solutions and then uh, the solutions for iot enabled sensor what are the artifacts which are useful for a farmer is not as abundantly available the platform needs to be educated enough in languages so we have lang- uh, like we have uh, the uh, the knowledge barrier as my said earlier as well so right uh, so right knowledge should be given what will happen after first year what will happen after second year what will be the advantages of this if being in a field so these are the knowledge challenges and then uh, uh, and yeah, then the community, think, uh, the community the, adoption yeah i think that covers the 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 two biggest points i mean one is a uh, lack of awareness and the second one being uh, the cost uh, so mahesh so to end the session i'll actually turn it over to you uh, how do you feel like these two barriers of adoption cost and uh, let's say awareness can be overcome here yeah, yeah these two points are very uh, uh, pertinent now uh, in a single word i should say that okay we should bring the confidence in the farmer that okay iot things will work we should bring the confidence in him that okay these are work as he mentioned as shushan mentioned most of, uh, more than 45% of the indian uh, farming community falls in uh, bpl below poverty level so we should look uh, to reduce the cost incurred for the iot things yeah got it yeah so uh, definitely as uh, these technologies become uh, more widely adopted price will come down um, but how do we get over the barrier of uh, of awareness and trust ha there are many institutes uh, seus are there state agricultural universities uh, 
ಕೃಷಿ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನ ಕೇಂದ್ರ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಗ್ರಿಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಗೌನ್ ಬೈ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಸೊ ದೇರ್ ಆರ್ ಮೆನಿ ಸ್ಕೀಮ್ಸ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ಇಂಪ್ಲಿಮೆಂಟಿಂಗ್ ಆಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ವೆನ್ ರಿಕ್ವೈರ್ಡ್ ಓನ್ಲಿ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಈಸ್ ದೋ ಅಪ್ಗ್ರೇಡೆಡ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜೀಸ್ ದೇ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ದೇರ್ ಸ್ಕೀಮ್ಸ್ ದೀಸ್ ಟು ಬಿ ದೀಸ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಟೇಕನ್ ಕೇರ್ ಬೈ ದ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಕೆ ವಿ ಕೆಸ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಗ್ರಿಕಲ್ಚರ್ ಸೊ ದಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ಫಾರ್ಮೇಷನ್ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಬಿ ಸ್ಪ್ರೆಡ್ ಓವರ್ ಅಕ್ರಾಸ್ ದ ಫಾರ್ಮಿಂಗ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಟಿ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ ಬಿಲ್ಡ್ ದ ಕಾನ್ಫಿಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ದ್ಯಾಮ್ you say that uh, that hasn't been done yet but actually uh, from my experience right now we are seeing that i mean we are seeing um research institutes and uh, state governments start to explore the the idea of precision farming and smart farming right absolutely absolutely right now they are into the implementing in their institutes but uh, i feel uh lab to land is not happened in the sense still there in the lab but not in the lab land okay uh, correct, yeah. correct and yeah. uh and finally i mean uh, most let's say new agriculture products uh when they're introduced into the market uh, whether it be a new seed variety or a new nutrient uh, or a new uh, pest or disease uh treatment uh trials are done right um where they do multi location trials get lo- get the local mm-hmm. community involved um yep. so i also feel that that could uh, also increase the adoption and build awareness and trust where um basically farmers like to uh, believe what they see so um having it uh, you know done locally uh, within their own fields or their friends fields um will and will push this technology forward yes yes absolutely you are right the traction is happening but not at a like say 100% right great yeah. okay yeah so i think uh, that kind of wraps up our hour um uh, thank you so much uh, mahesh and Su- and sushant uh, i think this was a great discussion um a lot of good points we talked about uh we started off talking about the problems that farmers face uh, um focused on uh, problems that are happening on farm um talked about how digital technologies and uh, smart farming technologies are helping farmers and then finally uh concluded with uh, some thoughts on how uh, adoption and awareness can be increased so i think this was a great discussion overall thank you so much for your time and uh, yeah thanks thank you varun thank you all and all uh, for this opportunity thank you team thank you very much